Most of the stuff that's going on is not vital. It's a trivial many versus the vital few. And, and I think it's not just one more thing to figure out what those vital few things are. It is the work of life. Greg McEwen is the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less. In the book, Greg describes an approach similar to minimalism that gets us to ask the right questions about where we're spending our time, energy, and effort. This is my edited conversation with Greg about his essentialist philosophy, the myth of success, and why small, consistent steps far outweigh the alternative. You can get the full one-hour interview on Patreon. Enjoy. Greg, thanks so much for being here. Really excited to talk with you, talking about the crossover between less and ambition. So mm-hmm. how can we do more with less? Um, before we delve too deep into that, uh, tell me a little bit about the work you do right now. Give me a little bit of an introduction. I wrote the book Essentialism. Uh, I, I, you know, this is, a, this is about the disciplined, continual, perpetual pursuit of less but better. Uh, I love how you just framed it as less but with ambition. Uh, it, it, it's, it's about how to figure out what is essential, eliminate what's not, and create a system for making it as effortless as possible to do what you've identified as being very important. When I look at our culture, I would say in America, but I'm sure it's spread pretty far, there is this work hard, hustle, grind it out, busyness that is promoted. And in a lot of ways, people, uh, they enjoy attaching this label to themselves. I'm so busy. Oh, I'm just overwhelmed with all this stuff that I have to do. Uh, how do you view our hustle culture today? And is that something that you, as you would describe it as? When I first came to America, I would ask people how they are. And uh, this is, we're talking almost 20 years ago. And they would say, uh, you know, they'd say, I'm great, I'm great. And it was almost like, I'm American, of course, I'm great. And, and I liked it. I liked this sort of inherent uh, optimism and, and positivity. I, I connected to that, I related to that. Uh, but if you ask people now, as often as not, when you ask them how they are now, the first word will be busy. I, I'm, I'm busy, I'm so busy. I'm good, I'm good, but I'm busy. I'm busy, busy. I mean, this whole flavors of busy. And so I do think that something has changed. It, it, it's not just in our own minds. Something has significant has changed. And even in those years, I think we've gone from being uh, connected to hyper-connected. And that, that's not a small change in the human condition. It, it shifts from a place where at some time we had information overload. Yes, we've had that for a long time, but we're now in a state of opinion overload. And so this is particularly the kind of busyness that I think is, is most potentially harmful, is where we're busy not because we just have a sense of internal mission that matters, a sense of contribution that we want to make in the world. It's that we're busy because other people are busy. We're doing things because other people are doing stuff. We see them on social media. Oh, that person's doing this thing. They're in that place. They're pursuing this idea. And so... Keeping up with the Joneses has been a deep part of human nature, I'm sure, forever. But when you add into it this hyper connection, this hyper um, comparison, then I think it gets to the point where people do feel pretty crazy all the time. So that, that, that people feel busy, but not productive. They feel stretched too thin at work or at home, but they don't feel a sense of accomplishment with it. They feel instead a, con- a constant sense of other people hijacking uh, their agenda, you know. And so it, 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 I, this, is the, this is the problem. The problem isn't that you have a lot to do. Problem... A, and it, it, LA is obviously a very busy place. <laughs> exactly, this is like the perfect moment for it. It, it. It's not just that you have a lot to do, it's, it's that you're being defined by this constant reactive comparison. This, I think, is really the issue. It's a, it's a badge of honor for a lot of people. The, uh, I remember when I was getting started out as a filmmaker, and a lot of the people that I surrounded myself with, who I thought were good mentors, talked about how they will sleep when they're dead. That 
working hard is the most important thing. That if they only got four to five hours of sleep or less, that's okay because they got the, the job done. That you can smile and be happy once you have the money, once you have the success. Mm. Um, is this something that you've seen? Because you've worked with a lot of startup and tech companies. This kind of culture, is it heightened there in, the, in certain environments where maybe it's entrepreneurial driven or people are trying to create something for themselves? Yes, I mean, I think that, I mean, this is where I first observed the phenomenon, which is that working with Silicon Valley companies, I noticed that, um, you know, in the early days of a company, they would be, you know, maybe have a state of clarity, a certain clarity, a sense of this is what we're trying to do, and this is who we are, and this is who we aren't, and this is what we're not trying to do, and so they would have that clarity. If they got that clarity, it would drive success. And with the success would come an increase of options and opportunities. And that sounds like the right problem to have. That whole pattern, everything I just described. But it did in fact turn out to be a problem if all of that opportunity, those options, if it pulls you into what Jim Collins has called the undisciplined pursuit of more. And if these companies would fall into that problem, they would start to plateau in their progress or start to fail altogether. Now that's true for companies, and it's also true for individuals. The same pattern, the same problem. And so what I found was a sort of paradox of success, that success, if let, uh, allowed to be undisciplined, would become a catalyst for failure. And, and that, that undermines everything. You, you, you've got people who are driven, capable, curious. They've got all the things perhaps they need to be able to break through to the next level, but they don't. And it's because of this pattern. And so that's why essentialism subtitle is the disciplined pursuit of less. It's because it's an antidote to that problem. That's the whole idea. And that we can become essentialists before we have to, before we start to fail altogether, before we see that we've given up all the things that mattered most for all the things that mattered least. You can act upon your life and upon your uh, desire to make a contribution uh, and, and become more discerning so that you can go from a level of success and contribution to an even higher level of contribution. In the book you say it's the disciplined pursuit of less but better. Yeah, it's a really important distinction. And I think that there are some people, perhaps Gary Vaynerchuk, who I haven't sat down to talk with yet, who would likely say it's the pursuit of more but better. As in, we don't have to do less. We can, if we find out our path, what we're really passionate about, we can work even harder to get there. Is that something, and this is just my assumption of maybe where his views are at, I could be totally wrong, yeah. but I think this is probably something that a lot of people would identify with. Uh, something that I identify with, being somebody who is incredibly passionate about filmmaking and right. oftentimes stretching myself too thin starting to work on weekends, working nights, even though I have the freedom to choose not to do that. Mm -hmm. um, how do you view that mentality of trying to fit even more in when we know exactly what we should be working on? I mean, one of the responses that I have to that is if non-essentialism, meaning if the undisciplined pursuit of more is working for someone, keep doing it, right? If it's producing the results it promises, well, then carry on, ignore everything I'm saying. So if non-essentialism is producing breakthrough contribution, really meaningful relationships, a satisfying life, happiness in the moment, and a sense of mission for the future. I mean, if it's delivering on those things, keep doing it. The problem is that non-essentialism doesn't, for most people, and I might even say anybody, deliver on its promise. So, so what it actually produces is short-term, it can sort of present a, a short-term burst of, of activity, but it quickly becomes a diminishing return, right? So if you do the five hours a night, yeah, you can do five hours a night. You, you can do that for a few nights. But there's a point at which the discernment level starts to go down, the joy level goes, starts to go down. And, it, it, and, and if your joy and discernment starts to go down, it means that you have less ability to pick the right next project. And so very quickly, you are falling into the pattern of plateauing. Yes, you're doing more, you're, do, you're doing lots of things and they're all interesting to you, but you're actually, what you're not noticing is that you're starting to lose the edge that you absolutely require, you must have in order to discern the next big level of contribution. 
I mean, I can I can speak to this in my in my own life in a variety of ways. But it, you know, one of the experiences that led me to really focus on this subject in this book was that I mean, you know, I got an email from uh, my colleague at the time said, "Look, Friday would be a very bad time for uh, your wife to have a baby." because I, I need you to be at this client meeting between one and two. And look, and I'm sure they were joking, and, and yet somehow I took it as a responsibility, a burden, a, you know, I've got to navigate this, balance this. Uh, Friday comes along, that is when we're in the hospital, my wife's just had our daughter. We're, we're, you know, instead of being focused, I allow another passion, another interest to confuse it. And so I go, to my shame, to the meeting, and even if some great thing had come from that meeting, which in fact it didn't, uh, surely and clearly I made a fool's bargain. Uh, what I learned from that lesson is the simplest idea, which is if you don't prioritize your life, someone else will. And, and that's that idea of being a heightened awareness of what the priority is and making sure that we aren't just busy pursuing lots of things, but that we are creating space to actually pause and discern and make sure that we're sleeping enough so that our discernment is intact, so that we can keep on figuring out what is the most important contribution I can make. And so that's what I'm saying. I say there's an inherent trade-off when people are just, I'm so interested, I'm so passionate, I'm going to do more of everything. Yeah, there's an advantage to that for a time, perhaps but you're giving up something along the way as well. And you have to be careful about what you're giving up because otherwise you wake up one day and you say, my goodness, I've done all these different things, but I basically lost my way. I, I don't know what it is anymore that I want to do. And you're so consumed and you've been so consumed and this happens for years for people's lives. And then they wake up, why am I even doing this? And they got, they got disconnected. And, and that's the risk. I mean, success is a very poor teacher. That's what Bill Gates said anyway, right? He should know. That's an interesting person to say that. So we shouldn't let success dictate the next thing we do. We should let conscience and our internal you know, uh, clarity be the guide. But to, to allow that to be the guide, we have to behave in a variety of ways to make sure that we can even hear it amidst all the noise, amidst all the passionate projects. And that, to me, is a much better guide and a much better way to ensure that we actually get utilized for our best and highest use rather than just the latest interesting project. How do we say no to things? Because saying no is really uncomfortable. Saying yes feels good. When somebody says, hey, like we'd love to grab coffee and pick your brain or just chat a little bit. Right. Saying yes leaves you feeling good, leaves them feeling good for the short term. In the long term then, when it comes to that day when you have to meet up with them, you're like, oh, I'm already so busy. <laughs> I yeah. don't have time to, to do this. So how do we tactfully say no to people? I actually think the first thing you have to accept is that we are saying no all the time and everybody is. What we are not aware of is that we are saying no. So we're just saying no in, an, in, in a, in a uh, you know, compulsive way. Every time I check email, I'm saying no to something. Every time I, you know, randomly go on social media or on you know, on YouTube, which is its own kind of social media. Uh, every time you get pulled into some binging, watching something, you're saying no to stuff. And so in a sense, we're quite good at saying no. We just don't use the words no. And so we have to, in a way, apply that same logic to more important projects, more important work, so that we just pause before saying, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do that. We pause before going on social media. I mean, yes, we have to learn how to be able to communicate to other people. And, and maybe we'll get back to that. But, but I actually think the first thing we need to learn about saying no is, is, is just within ourselves. Do you find that sometimes you need to sprint, that you need to maybe put in a little bit more hours or tip the scale in one direction uh, to finish a project? Or do you find that generally your balance is, is in check? Well, I think that I think that what you I think my experience and my expectation is that unexpected things will come up. Like that is what my experience has taught me. You think it will be like X, but really there will be things you didn't plan for. And that's exactly why you have to create buffer in the system. That's why you should not take on every project you think you can do. 
even if you're interested, even if it's aligned, even if, and I can name so many things like that for me that I've just gone, I mean, for example, uh, executive coaching. I mean, coaching. I mean, there's a real demand for essentialism coaching. And, and I have requests in all sorts of ways for that. And, and I could list a whole line of other kinds of products and services that people will proactively ask for. And I feel tempted by all of them because I want to make a difference because it aligns with so many of the things that I want to do. But if I were to say yes to all of them, I would be violating the thing I've observed in all of my life, which is that there will be unexpected things. So you start the coaching, you start, oh, well, I'll provide some coaching to a few people. Yeah, but that takes twice as long, three times as long as you really thought it would. You gotta prepare for it, you gotta think about it, you gotta, they, they cancel on you multiple times, you cancel on them for things, everything comes up, and suddenly what you thought was X is really three X of time and energy. In fact, I have a CEO friend who says to me that he takes every time and budget estimate and multiplies it by pi. <laughs> and I thought he was exaggerating at first, but I found that to be really accurate. And so, so I think the key is not to say, well, do I push extra at the, in those moments or not? Well, yeah, I mean, if you want to get the thing done, you're bound to have to push harder than you thought. It's to make sure you're not taking on so many things that when you do that, you're pushing out things that are far more important but less urgent to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so it's by me. I didn't write a book for, for like at least two years now since the publisher was ready to, the agent's ready to, I'm even ready to, but no, it doesn't feel right. Show restraint. Two years, that's hard to, 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 to not do it. But it means that now when I've just come to the point where I feel ready to do it and the timing feels right, you know, I didn't ruin relationships for the last two years. And I could have damaged any number of relationships in my family if I just said, oh yeah, I wanna do it and they're ready, let's do it. Let's add another whole huge project. So I think the key is, how to not have those projects in the first place. Be careful what you take on. Don't take it on just because you can. Don't take it on just because it's good. Make sure it's the right thing at the right time for the right reasons. Then when you get to execution, there's buffer built in so you can actually spend the extra time you need to. To me, it feels like there's a lot in common with finances and creating a security fund. That's like the first thing, the first right. step that Dave Ramsey right. and everybody talks about if you're trying to head towards financial independence. It's save up a thousand dollars, put it in a glass box underneath your bed, hide it away and make right. sure that you don't touch it unless there's an emergency right. and it creates a buffer. And that's something that I did when I was pursuing a career, creating original content. I needed a buffer. I needed to say, okay, I have a year's worth of living expenses in the bank. Now I feel much more confident, free, and flexible that I can pursue this without stress or anxiety. And what you're saying is that we can do that same exact thing with time. Totally, and it's exactly what one should do. And, and I suspect it could be one of the items on your checklist as you think through those first questions is not just am I interested, passionate about this, is it aligned, but one more question, if I do this, will I have buffer for the, ex the other projects in my life that I've already identified as being essential? And that's just one little thing that you say, I won't think about it unless it's there. I won't remember to ask that question, but you build it in to, you build it in to remind yourself so that you slow down uh, in the decision-making process. Yeah, I mean, buffer, I mean, my children and I play a game, a buffer game in the car where we, we drive, you know, we'll drive from point A to point B, and my goal is to never stop the car. You know, even for a stoplight. So how do you do that? You have to create a lot of distance between mm. you and the car in front of you so that you can go slower, that's fine, but you never stop. And that's me trying to teach them, through a fun game, the principle of buffer. In our life, I want to be able to make progress. I want to make steady progress. I don't want to have huge starts and stops. Yeah, it's the consistency that produces incredible breakthroughs. Uh, and Buffer's key, absolutely key to doing that. I imagine it takes a lot of patience to live like that. Yeah, and I don't feel like a, an, a I don't feel especially patient. I don't think, actually, I think that's probably, you know, among my main weaknesses. Uh, but, I have absolutely come to believe that the real kind, I don't mean patience like you're not bothered about something. Real patience is purposeful, uh, purposeful waiting, active waiting, 
uh, your intent is still there, but you're going to show like maybe an upper and lower bound on your behavior. I'll give you an illustration of what I mean. So, so uh, writing a journal. A lot of people want to write a journal. Lots of people start. Very few people continue writing a journal. Why? Uh, they wanted to. That's why they started. That's why they bought it. That's why they did it. I mean, the, the whole journal industry is like a bought books that never get written in. So, so there's two ways to approach it. And one way, the way the non-essentialist would approach it is by saying, okay, the first day I'm jumping into this, I care about this so much, I'm going to be so passionate about it. And, and they don't think about buffer or anything like that for the future. So they just jump in, they write three pages that first day. Completely like they blow out an hour, a couple of hours, do whatever. Day two, well, they don't have they don't have an hour, they don't have two hours, they don't even have half an hour built into their schedule, their routine to be able to do that. So there's no way they can do it day two. So day two, they're like, ah, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. And that's just almost over. Day three, they've got to make up for two days. There's no way they're going to do it. So it's almost over before it begins. So the essentialist way of doing that is says, says, okay, knowing what we know about unexpected things, we have to create buffer. Therefore, I will write every day a tiny amount, no more than five sentences no less than one sentence, upper and lower bound, because my goal is to do this consistently for a long time. So you're, it's almost like the impatience, the desire drives consistency once you have the right mindset. And, and, and let me just tell you what that looks like over a long period of time. Uh, my, when my grandfather died, my Jewish grandfather died in New York, and I went to his house right after that happened, only wayward English relative that had made it to America. I'm there, I'm looking through everything. What do I notice he's left behind? Uh, nothing. Uh, I, I don't even know properly who to invite to his funeral because, because I've just got like telephone books with them. I don't know who's who. I don't know if this person just is like, I don't know if it's the plumber or if it's one of his good friends. It's all in his head and it all went with him. When my other grandfather passed away, I, I was able to get a copy of a book that he'd been writing. One sentence every two or three days of 50 years in one book. Uh, that, that's, that's, to me, that's extraordinary to have, uh, to have that much accomplished through such a simple mechanism. So that's what we're going for. We want consistency over the long run about something that really matters. That's, that's all under this principle of execution, the, the, but the essentialist approach to execution. It's a small amount over a long period of time rather than a big unexpected thing, you know, you do it, you try and do it, you force it, and it doesn't last long. The second, the, the, the first is so much more powerful and, and more effortless than the, than the second approach. We talked a little bit about uh, technology and social media and how it can become a source of distraction for us. And this is not something that's different than past technological advancements. When books came around or radio or television, people tend to be frightened of new technologies. Mm. Is there something different about social media? And, and we even hinted at it at the beginning of the conversation with the busyness seems to be a little bit different than times past. Uh, do you find social media, what role do you use it in your life? And, and how do you recommend people approach this who perhaps want to be creators online and they want to build a personal brand, how do you do that without letting it, the negative side come in? Yeah, so, you know, all technology, literally all of it, makes a good servant and a poor master. And social media is no different in that sense than anything that came before. But it takes time to, to develop the new skills and wisdom when a new technology comes in. And so the risk is that we throw the baby out with the bathwater. And that's happened before in, you know, in the industrial revolution, you know, so many gains made, but so many things lost that nobody was even looking at or thinking about. And the same is true with social media. So, so, so yes, one has to look at what, am, what, am I, what do I want intentionally to get from it? What is the, what is the exchange of value I'm willing to make for what benefit. And I think if people use it consciously, thoughtfully, 
you know, what you just described a moment ago, you say, okay, YouTube's the channel I want to be on. This serves the purposes I'm trying to achieve. The other things a lot less so. I think I can de-invest in those items. If I'm ever going to invest, it's just through Buffer. Right? This is a disciplined way of using that tool. The undisciplined way of using the tool is just to get on there with barely a thought, with a just general, general idea, oh, I, I want lots of followers. And that's what I think most people do. I mean, that's what, if, you, if you look at other people's feeds, you often find on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on, uh, on Instagram, just sort of a randomness to it. What? what? So how's anyone even going to follow you? How, why would they follow you? What, what's the message you're trying to share? So I think figuring out, you know, you can't say everything to everyone. So figuring out what is it I'm trying to say to the world? What is my very tightly, you know, uh, carefully curated message I'm trying to share? And then you use the tools to be able to enable you to share that message and engage. But I think the order really matters. If you're just out there randomly doing it, I think you'll get consumed by the noise uh, rather than you being able to be an important uh, voice of clarity for people on there. Something you said in the book is that more effort doesn't always correlate to more results. Right. So if somebody was looking to pursue an essentialist, path, looking to be more intentional with how they work, how they spend their time. What would you say to try to, to convince them to just slow down a little bit, to make time for this, to, to focus and be deliberate? The justification for slowing down, becoming more deliberate, becoming more focused is single. And it's this, if you really believe that a few things are exceptionally valuable, and most other things are noise, then you will automatically, spontaneously, naturally start to change your behavior. You start to say, okay, well, what are those few things? And you start to do everything we've talked about. Well, if only a few things matter, then I'll create space. I'm going to start asking, what are they? What is essential? And you're going to start saying, look, if it's, if it's non-essential, I want to start eliminating it, getting rid of it. And I'm going to try and then create a system that helps me to keep doing and focused on the things that really matter and really a high leverage. If you believe that, it drives the behavior. If you believe that all things are approximately of the same value, then you, it's like, it's like you, you, you're just shoveling coal. You're in a coal mine. You're just trying to get out as much as possible. And your job is to get more and more of it. And the way to do it is just to push more and more, shovel more and more. Becoming an essentialist is like discovering that you, 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 you've lived your whole life in a coal mine. You suddenly go, it's not a coal mine. I'm in, I'm in a diamond mine. Here I was thinking it was all about just how much to get out. And it's no, it's about finding those things that are really precious and valuable and important. And as soon as you suddenly wake up and you're in a, a, a diamond mine, your behavior shifts. And that's the same. This is the driver of, of becoming an essentialist is to suddenly see, you know, uh, somebody else says, not me. It's, it's difficult to overstate the unimportance of practically everything. Uh, the idea is get that, get that new thinking in. And, and, and as soon as you start to look at the, the world through that lens, you find, yep, that is in fact far closer to reality. That most of the stuff that's going on is not vital. It's a trivial many versus the vital few. And, and I think it's not just one more thing to figure out what those vital few things are. It is the work of life. Figure out what they are, eliminate what they aren't, and build a system that protects and enables you to, to pursue those things that you've said are mo you know, most important. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Again, if you want to get the full one hour unedited interview with Greg, it's available at patreon.com slash mattdiavella. Greg walks me through the practical steps of how to apply essentialism to my own life, and perhaps yours as well. See you next time.